are you an expert struggling with the changes or struggling to integrate as you move to a new country? Today, I have James Wilson with me from WMA Coaching, WMA Life Coaching, in fact, who is not only a cognitive behavioral therapist, but he's also a master life coach. And he helps experts just like you to navigate the challenges and the changes that come with moving abroad and relocating to a different country. Now, James today is going to share with you some really valuable tips about how to integrate better, how to deal with the changes that come with relocating. And he will tell us what are experts like yourself commonly struggling with and how can they solve these problems. Welcome to the show, James. Hi, Mike. It's lovely to be here. Without further ado, let's dive in. How long have you been doing this for? I qualified as a cognitive behavioral therapist in 2008. So I've been working since then in the therapeutic field. And I moved to the US last year and I began my life coaching journey this year. So yeah, I've been doing it since 2008, helping people primarily. When 2012, I moved to France and that's where I started to work primarily with expat and the expat community. We've been working so just over 10 years, sort of 11 years with the expat community. Basically, you're from the UK, you moved to yeah. France and America. So you have a, your fair share of experience of being an expat. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So what were the things that struck you first when you first moved abroad what was different moving to france the language obviously became the first uh, difference so i had to navigate setting up a business the tax stuff bank accounts all, all of that and that was tough because you had to have a certain i didn't really know french when i moved to france so i had to develop uh, a certain level of french to get myself to be understood when I would walk into tax offices and things like that. So that was a big thing to do. And it was the first time I'd set up a business as well. So I had to think about who my market was, my ideal customer, and where would I find them? So that was a lot of looking up English speaking psychologists, psychiatrists, the international school, various groups and doing a lot of traveling around the city I was living in. I was living in Toulouse in the south of France, traveling around, meeting all of these people and starting to get myself known. So there was a lot of work involved, a lot of shoe leather to be worn by doing that. So it was to getting to know the city, the system, everything really. So when you moved to Toulouse, was there a big expat community there that you could start networking with or did you try to make friends with the locals? Yeah, no, from that perspective, yeah, there was. We'd moved to my wife's work and there's the world headquarters of this very big company in Toulouse. So there is actually, for a relatively medium-sized city in France, there's a surprisingly large amount of expats and there's a lot of international students as well so I would tap into that market so from a work perspective there was yeah there was a market for what I was providing which was fantastic and then I think almost from a personal perspective that was getting to know the locals so that became important more from a personal perspective I think from a work perspective because my unique selling point was that I spoke English that was where I was going with that and back then you were still doing cognitive behavioral therapy, right? This was the service. That's right. Provided. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where did the coaching come from? Right? Why coaching? I think moving to the US kind of made me reflect on what I could do, what I could offer. And I start to really look at the coaching route and understanding that. And what became apparent very quickly was the way I work as a therapist is basically I'm a coach anyway. Because my first question with clients is, what's your goal of our work? What do you want to change? How do you want to things to be at the end of the process from how they are today? So as a therapist, I'm forward facing. I'm a behavioralist. I'm about action and helping people take action. They're in line with their values. So there was an, a, a huge synergy between how I was working as a therapist and coaching. So it was a natural fit for me. It's somewhat of a eureka moment. It's very interesting that you say that. Can you help our viewers understand better what coaching actually is? The difference, I say, between coaching and therapy as it's presented, coaching is a forward-facing process. So it's about goal setting. It's about 
having an action plan to reach those goals. And there's also functioning is in there as well. So people kind of day to day are functioning, they get through the day, but maybe they've got specific goals and specific areas that they'll help to reach. Whereas therapy classically may be more about the past and sitting in the past and understanding those things. Or obviously there's a diagnostic element as well in the therapy, which coaching doesn't deal with. It won't take people that have been diagnosed with social anxiety disorder or generalized anxiety disorder, for example. So if people come with a diagnosis, they would go to a therapist. So that's a difference there. So coaching, yeah, for me, it's about giving people tools. It's about empowering people to reach where they want to get to. Thank you for sharing that. Now, to stay in the coaching position, may Hmm. I ask you a challenging question? Okay. So you said coaching is about moving forward. It's about achieving future goals. And it typically doesn't deal with past traumas or past issues, right? Can we really move into the future and achieve our goals without processing our past or without changing past behavioral patterns? It's certainly about you recognize the past and you would recognize how the past might be influencing today. So you might ask the question, which would be, I think, a fair coaching question. Has that worked? Has how you've done things in the past from a workability perspective, if you've taken an action and maybe taken an action repeatedly, has it worked? So you would frame it in that sense. So if that hasn't worked, do we want to try a different behavior to see if we can get a different outcome. So you certainly learn from the past, absolutely, because we're in some senses a product of our past. But it's about, so it's about understanding it, but it's about applying it today. What can we learn from the past and what can we change today and in the future? So in a practical sense, if it was about therapy, contrary to coaching, how would therapy deal with this? I would probably ask the same question as I would in the coaching scenario, but classically for a traumatic situation, you might go back and you might process that traumatic event. So you'd be sitting in the past and reprocessing. So there's things like EMDR, different type of therapy that processes and reprocesses traumatic memories. So you're really sitting in the past with that. Whereas, as I say, with coaching and with how I, how I work, it's learning and then reflecting and changing. Okay. Now, then you moved to America and then you started doing the expert coaching. In Mm. your experience, what are the typical problems experts were struggling with? If you go through the process almost chronologically, it can start with homesickness. It can start with the grieving process, missing things and people and places and then it can be an issue around integration and integrating finding human beings are tribal we need we like to have a tribe we're social so it's about finding a tribe and things like feeling an anxiety might prevent us from reaching out and finding our tribe so there's that aspect to it there's cultural assimilation and understanding a new culture And there could be work aspects of it too, culturally, in terms of integrating into a new work culture, how to deal with colleagues that might have a different mindset, see things differently. So you've got that aspect of things as well. And there's also another aspect, which is reintegration. So moving home and people can struggle with that. So an expat coach, but also a reintegration coach as well so you've got that aspect of it too helping people readjust to returning uh, home a gamut really of different things and which of these do they typically find most difficult like where does the biggest pain points arise really in my experience i think it, it can be that the sadness moving into loneliness and isolation and i think i work with a particular strand of client within the expat community spouses People who have moved with someone who's moved with for work, for example. So the spouse has maybe given up a career, has moved away from family, from friends, but doesn't necessarily have that focus of work. Mm. So their spouse is going to work or working every day, and they've got this isolation and this loneliness to deal with. So that's certainly a big strand of people that I work with, helping them deal with that and then helping them move forward 
to make the most of their experience, to recognize what's important to them, what they value, and how they can do things that that meet their values. It's really interesting that you say that because this is quite typical actually in the digital nomad community as well, that people move away and they of course miss friends or they feel very isolated and that's why it's a growing trend to move into co-living, co-working spaces together mm. so mm. that uh, they can attach to another community. As, uh, as you said, we are tribal creatures. Mm. And many people find solace in this community, even they don't have that deep connection or they don't know each other for so long. But there are some common traits, common values that they share. So they mm. find it easier to connect. But if you move for your profession and you're not a digital nomad and to integrate into the local community, it can mm. take some time for sure. Absolutely. So what would you advise people who are in this situation right now that they moved abroad, they don't necessarily have a community and they might be feeling a bit lonely or isolated in this new environment? What would be a good first step for them to take to overcome this? So I have a four-step change process that I work with people once we've understood a situation a bit better. And early on in those four steps, step two actually is self-compassion. So that's really important to say it's okay to feel this sense of loneliness and sadness. And that's important because the expat, part of the expat experience sometimes is this idea of what other people think. Other people think, oh, I'm having an amazing, living an amazing life and what a great journey it is. And I've got to be posting all these things on Facebook and Instagram and what have you about, look at me having a great time. And there's a certain pressure that I shouldn't be feeling this way. I should be happy. I should be grateful or what have you. So actually early on, it starts with self-compassion. It starts with, it's okay to feel these things. We don't have to force them away. We can accept them. We then ask a question of, do we want our actions to be defined by those emotions? And that's a slightly different thing. But actually the first step is self-compassion. It's kindness. It's okay to have this, mm. this emotional response. So that's the very first thing I talk to people about. Uh, before we move on to the other three things, you said you have a four-step process. I'm curious to hear about the other four mm -hmm. steps as well. I'd like to ask, when people go through this sorrow, let's say, or they feel like they need to fit in, you said there is an element of peer pressure from social media that's coming into this, that they should be feeling amazing and they need mm. to portray that their life is great, even they mm. are not feeling that way. Why do you think that is? Probably inherent in the the way that the Facebook has evolved and, and social media has evolved. It's let's post pictures of ourselves having a great time and then you get into almost like social media anxiety. Why am I not having such a good time as them? They're always doing fun things. My life isn't as fun as them. So you can almost get a social media anxiety. On the other side, it's probably in the nature of the beast, I think. And and I think human beings, they can often be a case of the grass is greener. People always think the grass is always greener on the other side. So oh, they must be having a great time. They're in America, they're in France, they're in wherever. So I think it's probably partly the human condition and partly just the systemic nature of social media. Thanks. That's uh, really valuable to understand how this motivates us to feel a certain way, even though we don't have to comply, right? We don't have any obligation mm. to comply. It just triggers these negative feelings sometimes, maybe, right? Unwanted feelings, as I call them. We try and move away from the language of negative feelings. There are unwanted feelings. <laughs> But a feeling, any, all feelings are equally valuable and part of the human process. So I try and move away from the positive feelings and negative feelings. There are just feelings. It's interesting when you take the labels of them. What is the second step? Self-compassion is the second step. The first step is actually, so it's focus reset. So my work is predicated on the two minds approach. So we have the conscious mind, and this is how I would describe it to clients. And our conscious mind is where our values and our wisdom and our kindness and our logic reside. It's us, basically. But then we have the rooted mind, and this is where our thoughts and feelings and urges come from. And we don't control this part of the brain. So it's constantly telling us stories about what other people think, how things will go, what's going to happen. And it can hook the conscious mind. And um, what happens is people have this idea of, if I think it, then it must be true. If I think Mike doesn't like me, if I think Mike thinks I'm boring, 
then it must be true because it's hooked in together. So what we need to do is get some distance because we need to get the conscious mind in charge. So for me, conscious James needs to be in charge. Wisdom, kindness, values, logic. So the first step is actually focus reset, which is just like a very brief one minute mindfulness exercise, just to try and help get that distance. So the rest of the steps are being done by the conscious mind as opposed to by the rooted mind. So step one is focus reset to get the conscious mind in charge. And step two, that is that self-compassion to get some kindness for ourselves and the emotions we may be feeling or the stories that mind is telling us just to stay. It's okay that's happening. I may not like it. I may not want it to be happening, but it's okay that it is. And then we can move on to the third step. Which is? Third step is reframing. So that's rational, realistic, healthy, helpful. So it's reframing how we look at the story our mind's telling us. So we look at, under reframing, we talk about motivation. Why am I doing something that makes me feel anxious? Because you know, for anxiety is probably the most common emotion that people t- describe when they come to me. And the number one behavioral response to anxiety is avoidance. Because you know, my brain's telling me something's dangerous, something bad's going to happen. I want to avoid that, so I'll, you know, I won't do it. We have to get to a point sometimes of the self-compassion to say it's okay to be anxious in a certain situation. It's natural. If you're taking a driving test or an exam or a first date or a job interview, there's going to be anxiety with that. So we just self-compassion to say it's okay. And then we might talk about motivation. So why are you going to do something that's going to make you feel uncomfortable? And then you might get into motivations. And that's important because ultimately we want people to do things that they value. And sometimes doing something we value brings with it anxiety. So you have a moment, a choice point. Do I want to be defined by my emotion or do I want to be defined by my value in doing something that's important? So yeah, as we reframe things, so we look at things in a slightly different way, hopefully in a more rational, realistic, healthy and helpful way, and then we can move forward. You mentioned that much of the problems come from anxiety. When you say anxiety, is that like a social anxiety to meet other people or to try to connect with other people in this new setting or Mm -hmm. uh, is it something else yeah there's social anxiety is very present for people and can play a big role when people move to a new city new country new state if there's an anxiety in terms of meeting people again the natural response is to avoid but that will prolong the isolation and, and the loneliness so we have to deal with that so that can be a very common construct that I come across. The general conception is that the older you are, the more difficult it is to make friends. How true do you think that is? I think it becomes about opportunity. Moving to the US, one thing for me that helped meet people was I had a five-year-old son. So that presents the opportunity to meet people at the school gate. So it's the context, I think. Uh, I think when you're younger, you've got bars, you've got clubs, you've got perhaps there are more opportunities for clubs and social things. doesn't mean there's none at all for people of any age. It's just how many different opportunities are there to meet people. But there are absolutely, there are clubs, there are associations, there are different types of events for people of all ages. I think maybe some of those natural things say, for example, being a parent or going clubbing, become less uh, prescient when you get older. But there's certainly opportunities to meet people. Say um, somebody at at around the age of 40, they decide to move abroad, no children, no family, and they move for professional reasons. And let's say they need to build a new network or they just want to connect. Where would they find opportunities, as you put it? Well, it's funny because my fourth and final step of my change process is mindful, valued living. And it's the valued living part I would always start with. I would start with what's meaningful to you. What do you find fun? What do you find interesting? Is it about learning something new? Is it about game playing? Is it about sports? So you'd start with the values, what's important to you, and you'd work from that way in terms of looking for opportunities to meet people. So you you might be in your 40s, but you love rock climbing. Are there any rock climbing clubs? Tennis, are there any tennis clubs? Dungeons and Dragons, are there any board game cafes, bars around? So I think you always want to start with what's important to you, what you value, and you go from there. So for me, moving to the US, I joined Sally and over 35s soccer club. 
So we soccer play club. football. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Become American. Whichever side of the yeah. soccer football. So I play that once or twice a week. So that was a way of meeting people. Played tennis, met people through that. You've got international clubs as well. Things like there's an organization called Internations, oh, yeah. which chapters in very many cities around the world, they could have events. So what that gives you, obviously, if you're an expat, you could look for kind of, I've been to a British expat event here in DC. So you've got that avenue, plus you've got your values, avenues that will help connect to the local community as well. So it starts with values and it's move forward from there. I think it's really great advice to know what you want out of life and what's important, what's good for you and build a community around that or try to integrate into a community around that. I I think that's fantastic advice. Now, if somebody maybe in this situation, as we were talking, but they are an introvert. So if you moved abroad and you're a bit of an introvert, you were already having a difficult time making friends or putting yourself out there, Mm -hmm. how can you help them overcome the situation? It's always funny when someone says they're an introvert because I always wonder if they're an extrovert with anxiety that's making them appear like an introvert. So there's always that first thing I do is just to double check is someone actually an introvert. But then it's about workability. You ask that question, is acting like an introvert, let's say, workable? What's that doing to your overall mental health, your sense of contentment, of happiness, or what have you? So it starts with the workability. And it starts with, uh, if you're an introvert and you're coming to me, I guess something isn't quite working. And what would you like to change? So when I, so the first part of my work is that goal setting. So sometimes I use the documentary question so imagine the documentary camera crew is following you around recording your movements now and let's imagine them doing that at the end of our process what would you want them to be recording and documenting differently at the end of the process than maybe from things you're doing now you'd turn it into an action that way so it starts with the workability question is it working for you to act like an introvert and and maybe not do things and if not What are those things we could change? And then that's about that self-compassion piece to say that means you might be going to an event, you might be meeting new people, and that will bring anxiety. The self-compassion says that's okay. It's okay to be anxious. The reframing is if you're going to go to an event, is everyone there realistically going to be horrible and a terrible person? Usually not because they're in the same boat. They're wanting to make a new tribe too. And even if they were, imagine you went in through that door to meet a group of people and they were all horrible. And they said, what are you doing here? We're not going to talk to you. Okay, how are you going to deal with that? What are you going to do? Well, you'll probably leave, right? Because they're probably not your people. If they're all going to act like that and that isn't in line with your values, you'll leave. And you'll go, okay, maybe let's try something else instead. It's really interesting you say how is this working for you? So I know that when people go through fundamental transformations, they can often feel like they're challenging their own identity and they develop a very strong resistance about going through with that change because they feel like they're losing who they were. This can happen. Again, yeah, you're right. It comes back to the workability aspect of that. What is the outcome? How is that working out for you? Is there something you want to change about that? Again, people come to me usually because they want to change something. I don't think I've ever had a client that said, everything's fantastic and great, but I just wanted to come and have a chat with you about how great things are going for me. I suppose it's more when they realize how much work that change requires or how difficult that change can potentially be. And when they face that mountain, they might start off. How do you help them get over the mountain? How do you eat an elephant? More pieces. Yeah, one mouthful at a time. As soon as you use the analogy of a mountain, that's huge and that can feel overwhelming. So let's break it down. Let's go step by step. So when you help your clients integrate or let's say assimilate into the new environment or even back into their own old environment after living abroad for an extended period of time, what's the typical length of the engagement? It's a tough one to answer because everyone's different. I usually start with saying to people six 
12 sessions. I want to try and make some change quickly. And I, I want to present you with this um, process and I want you to try and implement it and to see make change. So change can happen after one session, but it can take longer. It depends on circumstance. It depends on the individual. So yeah, it's always a tricky one to answer. What was the greatest transformation you've ever seen in your career as an expat coach? One person <laughs> comes to mind, but it's almost like an anti-expat story. She was an expat when I first started working with her, and there were some issues in her relationship and in her career, and we worked through it. And actually, we ended up empowering her to go home. She ended her relationship, and she went home, and she's now thriving in a new relationship and in a new career. And it's an anti-expat coaching story because it's someone that went home. But actually, the reason that comes to mind, it's about that flexibility to say, okay, what's right for me? What do I need to do that's in line with my values? And it was just interesting. That was the first person that came to mind. In terms of people that have thrived, it has absolutely been about people who have built a social network. They feel connected to where they live. They feel that they are part of that community, that they have their tribe, that they've assimilated professionally and thrived. It's hard to pick out one because that's that's primarily what it's about. And that's what's really exciting. I'm so passionate about helping people make change and live their life according to their values. The ultimate question and the work that I do is the deathbed question. And that's on your deathbed. Can you look back and say, I lived my life according to my values? That's the ultimate question of this work. And we break that down and we take that day by day, month by month, year by year. But that's the ultimate question. Yeah. Have you been true to yourself? Have you lived with integrity? Wow. That's so deep. You mentioned the tribe and uh, we spoke a lot about connections. And that seems like a really big element of integrating and feeling well, feeling good in a new community or in a new society. What other elements are there to this equation that people need to be mindful of? Understanding just simple things like understanding the laws and the customs of ways, just things like that can, if you get tripped up by that stuff, can have a real big impact. So there's all those small, sometimes big, aspects of things to be aware of other than that i think it really is you're a human being you're going to a place full of other human beings there will be some things that are different culturally or linguistically but they're human beings and underneath it all human beings are all about values and so it's about recognizing and understanding yourself and and that's something that moving away from home brings because we don't necessarily consciously think about who we are or what we value when we're growing up because it just is. We just are on some level. Of course, you might go through that questioning process. That's partly what teenage years are for, but you're doing it potentially in a sort of familiar space. When you go away from that familiar space, it's all up for grabs and it really makes you have to reflect on things because suddenly, and this is when you're an adult, my five-year-old son just met kids other kids and became friends with them he's not had this existential thought process i don't suppose but when you're an adult and you move adult and you move away from home yeah you do reflect about where am i going to meet people where am i going to find work how am i going to communicate so suddenly these big fundamental questions come up and it's how we answer them and how we act on them that becomes important and finally i'm just very curious if somebody moved abroad and maybe they had to move to a country where they don't feel aligned with the country's values or the customs or the culture, but they have to spend a period of time there for whatever reason, maybe it's for family, maybe it's for work. What would you mm. advise those people who end up in a situation where they don't feel aligned with the country's culture or values? I think it would start with empowering them to, to own the choice to stay. Very few people are legally obliged to have to stay somewhere. So you might leave, but you might lose your job. But that's a choice. So I think it starts with why are you choosing to stay and empowering them to own that decision. And sometimes in life, it's about making the least worst choice as opposed to the best. So it's about owning that. Because if we don't own it, then we can 
become resentful. And that resentment will start to tinge our relationships, both in our family and externally. So it starts with the ownership of the choice to stay. And then another kind of key mantra for me is change the things you can change, except the things you can't. So within that, what choices have you got? How can you best serve your values within the choices that are available to you and doing that and going from there? Thank you for all this useful advice and this wealth of insight that you have provided about the expert life. Now, if an expert would like to reach out to you for help, where can they find you, James? So my website is wmalifecoaching.com. I also have a podcast on being good enough as well, which is available on all major platforms, which talks through my process. Every episode talks through my process in more detail. So yeah, that's where you'll find me. So please feel free to, to reach out. Thank you, James. So if you're in that situation, if you're an expert looking to accept the changes, looking to navigate the changes, do reach out to James. We can definitely help you with this, as you have heard. He's got a lot of experience and knowledge about this, and he's not only a coach, but he's also a therapist. So you can talk to him about deeper issues, maybe past problems that prevented you from achieving your future goals. Thank you for joining us today, James. And thank you too for listening. Please subscribe if you liked our episode today and listen out for the new and upcoming episodes. Thank you and bye-bye.